Chapter Four, in which Kazul has a dinner party and Simmerin makes dessert. Simmerin watched Therendril go with feelings of great relief. Now she had at least a month to find a permanent way of discouraging the knights, for she was quite certain that Therendril would spread the news of her injury. She decided to put up her sign anyway, just in case, and after a little looking, she found a scrubby tree beside the path and hung the sign on it. On her way back to Kazul's cave, she noticed that the two pieces of the ledge were still invisible, and she was very careful about crossing them. She looked down once out of curiosity and was immediately sorry. She was not comfortable with the sight of her own feet firmly planted on nothing at all with the sharp, spiky tops of spruce trees in full view some fifty feet below. Kazul arrived only a few minutes after Simmerin herself. Simmerin was looking for some thread to mend her skirts, which had gotten torn and stained while she climbing along the ledge, when she heard the unmistakable sounds of a dragon sliding into the main cave. Simmerin, Kazul's voice called. Coming, Simmerin called back. Abandoning her search, she picked up her lamp and hurried out to greet Kazul. I'm glad you're still here, Kazul said mildly, as Simmerine came into the large cave. Morans was quite sure you'd run off with a knight or a wizard. I couldn't make out for certain which. Is Morans the yellow-green dragon who wanted to eat me? Simmerine asked. Because if he is, he's just trying to make trouble. I'm well aware of that, Kazul said with a sigh that sent burnt bread smell halfway across the cave. But things would be easier for me if you didn't provide him with any material to make trouble with. Exactly what happened? Well, Marwin came to visit this afternoon, Simmerin began. We were talking about all the interruptions I've been having, and she, she suggested putting up a sign. She explained why she had gone to put up her sign herself and told Kazul in detail about her meetings with the wizard, the dragon, and the prince. So Morwen was here, Kazul said. She sat back and the scales of her tail rattled comfortably against the floor. That simplifies matters. Did you bring the sign back with you? No, I, I found a tree and hung it by the path, Simmerine said, wondering what this was all about. In case Therendil doesn't tell everyone about my anchor after all. Better still, Kazul said, and smiled fiercely, showing all her teeth. Moran's is going to regret meddling. Meddling in what? My business. I'd like a little more of an explanation than that, if you don't mind giving one, Simmerin said, with a touch of exasperation. Kazul looked startled, then thoughtful. Then she nodded. I keep forgetting that you're not as empty-headed as most princesses, she said. Sit down and make yourself comfortable. This may take a while. Simmerin found a rock and sat on it. Kazul settled into a more restful position, folded her wings neatly along her back, and began. It has to do with status. Dragons aren't required to have princesses, you see. Most of us don't. There are never enough to go around, and... Some of us prefer not to have to deal with the annoyances that come with them. Knights, Simmerine guessed, among other things, Kazul said, nodding. So having a princess in residence has become a minor mark of high status among dragons. A minor mark? Kazul smiled. I'm afraid so. It's the equivalent of, oh, serving expensive imported fruit at dinner. It's a nice way of showing everyone how rich you are, but you could make just as big an impression by having some of those fancy pastries with the smooth glazed icing and spun sugar roses. I see. Simmerine did see, though she found herself wishing that Kazul had found something else to compare it to. The talk of dinner reminded her too much of Moran's repeated desire to eat her. Moran's is young and not very bright, I'm afraid, Kazul said almost as if she had read Simmerine's mind. He seems to have the mistaken impression that if a princess behaves badly, it reflects on the dragon who captured her. Perhaps it comes from his inability to keep any of his own princesses for more than a week. 
Some of the lesser dragons were very snide about it when he lost his third one in a row. I believe she sneaked out while he was napping. I don't see how he can blame his princesses, Simmerine objected. I mean, if most princesses are unwilling, it must be fairly usual for them to try to get away. Of course, but Moran's doesn't see it that way. He's been trying to catch someone else's princesses in a similar foolishness for years. And he's quite sure he's finally done so. He's undoubtedly spreading the story of your escape far and wide at this very minute. Oh dear, said Simmerine. Kazool smiled again, and her teeth glittered silver in the lamplight. He'll look extremely foolish when it becomes obvious that you're still here. Which is one reason I've asked a few of my friends to dinner tonight. You've what? Simmerine said. All her worries about Moran's were instantly replaced by worries about fixing dinner on short notice for an unknown norma number of dragons. How many? What time will they be here? And where are we going to put them all? Six, around 8.30, in the banquet cave, and you won't be doing anything but dessert. I've already arranged for the rest of the meal. Arranged? With whom? Bolamore, the giantess. She's loaned me the cauldron of plenty that she uses when her twelve-headed son-in-law drops in for dinner unannounced. It'll handle most things, but all it can produce in the way of dessert is burnt mint custard and sour cream and onion ice cream. Ugh, said Simmerine. I see your problem. Exactly. Can you manage? Not if you want Cherry's Jubilee, Simmerine said, frowning. I haven't got a pot large enough to make seven dragons worth of Cherry's Jubilee. Would chocolate mousse do? I can make two or three batches, and there should be time for all of them to chill if you're not starting until 8.30. Chocolate mousse will be fine, Kazula assured her. Come along and I'll show you where to bring it. Simmerine picked up a lamp and followed Kazool into the public tunnels that surrounded Kazool's private caves. She was a little surprised, but when she saw the size of the banquet cave, she understood. It was enormous. Fifty or sixty dragons, perhaps even a hundred of them, would fit into it quite comfortably. Obviously, it had to be a public room. There simply wasn't enough space under the mountains of mourning for every dragon to have a cave this size. Kazool made sure Simmerine could find her way to the banquet cave without help, and then left her in the kitchen to melt slabs of chocolate and whip gallons of cream for the moose. By the time she was finished, she was hot and tired, and all she really wanted to do was take a nap, but Kazool was expecting her to serve the moose, and Simmerine wasn't about to appear before all those dragons in her old clothes with sweaty, sweaty straggles of hair sticking to her neck and a smear of chocolate across her nose. So, instead of napping, she pumped a cauldron of water, heated it on the kitchen fire, and took a bath. Once she was clean, she felt much better. She checked to make sure the moose was setting properly, and then went into her own rooms to decide what she should wear. Unfortunately, she was afraid she didn't have much choice. The wardrobe in her bedroom was full of neat, serviceable dresses, suitable for cooking or rummaging through treasure, but the only dressy clothes she had were the ones she had arrived in. She got them out of the back of the wardrobe and found to her dismay that the hem of the gown was badly stained with mud from her long walk. There was no time to clean it. She would have to wear one of the everyday dresses. <sighs> with a sigh, Simmerine turned back to the wardrobe and opened it once more to look for the nicest of the ordinary clothes. She gasped in surprise. The hangers were now full of the most beautiful gowns she had ever seen. Some were silk and some were velvet, some were heavy brocade, and some were layers of feather white gauze, some were embroidered with gold and silver, and some were sewn with jewels. Well, of course, Simmerine said aloud after a stunned moment. Why would a dragon have an ordinary wardrobe? Of course it's magic. What's in it depends on what I'm looking for. One of the wardrobe doors wag waggled slightly, and its hinges creaked in smug agreement. Simmerine blinked at it, and then shook herself and began looking through the gowns. She chose one of red velvet, heavily embroidered with gold, and found matching slippers at the bottom of the obliging wardrobe. She let her black hair hang in loose waves nearly to her feet, and even dug her crown out of the back of the drawer where she'd stuffed it on her first night. She finished getting ready a few minutes early. Feeling very cheerful, she went to the kitchen to fetch, fetch the moose.
It took Cimmerine four trips to get the moose down to the serving area just off the banquet cave. A dragon-sized serving was a little over a bucketful, and she could barely manage to carry two at a time. When everything was ready, she stood in the serving area and waited nervously for Kazul to ring for dessert. She could hear the muffled booming of the dragon's voices through the heavy oak door, but she could not make out what any of them were saying. The bell rang at last, summoning Cimmerine to serve dessert. She carried the moose into the banquet cavern, two servings at a time, and set it in front of Kazul and her guests. The dragons were crouched around a shoulder-high slab of white stone. Cimmerine had to be very careful about lifting the moose up onto it. Fortunately, she didn't have to wonder which dragon to serve first. She could tell which dragons were the most important from their places on the table, and she made a silent apology to her protocol teacher, who had insisted she learn about seating arrangements. Protocol had been one of her least favorite subjects. As she set the last serving in front of Kazul, one of the other dragons said in a disgruntled and vaguely familiar voice, I see the rumors are wrong again, Kazool. Or did you have to go after her and haul her back the way the rest of us do? Simmering turned angrily. But before she could say anything, a large gray-green dragon on the other side of the stone slab said, Nonsense, warg! Girls got more sense than that! You shouldn't listen to gossip. Next thing you know, you'll be chasing after that imaginary wizard Garim's been on about. Cimmerian recognized the speaker at once. He was Roxim, the elderly dragon she had given four of her handkerchiefs to. I suppose it was that idiot Moran's again trying to cause trouble, a purple-green dragon said with a bored distaste. Someone should do something about him. Kazool still hasn't answered my question, Warag said, and his tail lashed once like the tail of an angry cat and I'd like her to do so if the rest of you will stop sidetracking the conversation. Here now, Roxham said indignantly, that's a bit strong, Warag. Too strong, if you ask me. I didn't, Warag said. I asked Kazool, and I'm still waiting. I am very pleased with my princess, Kazool said mildly, and no, I didn't have to haul her back, as you would realize if you'd given the matter a little thought. Or does your princess normally leave seven servings of chocolate mousse in the kitchen when she runs away? Here, here, Roxim said. Simmery noted with interest that Warag's scales had turned an even brighter shade of green than normal, and that he was starting to smell faintly of brimstone. One of these days you'll go too far, Kazool, he said. You started it, Kazool pointed out. She turned to the gray dragon, What's this about Garim and a wizard, Roxim? You haven't heard, Roxim said, sounding surprised. Garim's been raving about it for weeks. Somebody snuck into her cave and stole a book from her library. No traces. But for some reason, she's positive it was a wizard. <laughs> Roxim sneezed, emitting a ball of flame that just missed hitting his bowl of mousse. Gives me an allergy attack just thinking about it. If it wasn't a wizard, who was it? The dragon at the far end of the table asked. Could have been anybody, an elf, a dwarf, even a human, Roxim replied. No reason to think it was a wizard just because Garim didn't catch him in the act. <laughs> Not with the amount of time he spends away from home. Which book did they lose? Said the thin brownish-green dragon next to Gazool. What does it matter? The purple-green dragon muttered. Some history or other, and, and that's another thing. Why would a wizard want a history book? No, no, Garim's making a lot of fuss over a common thief. That's what I say. It could have been a wizard, said the dragon at the far end. Who knows why they want the things that they want? Ridiculous, Roxham replied with vigor. A wizard wouldn't dare come through these parts of the mountains. They know what we'd do to him by George. Beg pardon. He added to the silver-green dragon, who appeared to be rather shocked by his language. I'm afraid you're wrong there, Kazool said. Simmering met one today, less than a two-minute flight from my cave. What? What? Roxon said. You're sure? That's done it, 
the purple green dragon rolled his head in an irritated gesture, so the scales made a scratching noise as they rubbed together. You'll never get him to quit talking about it now. Quite sure, Simmering assured Roxim. After glancing at Kazool to make sure she was expected to answer Roxim's question for herself, he made two bits of the ledge I was standing on turn invisible, so I would think it wasn't safe to keep going. Certainly sounds like a wizard to me, the dragon at the far end commented. What did he look like? asked the silver green dragon. Simmerine described the wizard as well as he could, and then added, He said his name was Zenimar. Zeminar. Zeminar? That's ridiculous, Warog snorted. Zeminar is, was the uh, elected head of the Society of Wizards last year. He wouldn't waste his time playing games with somebody's princess. Not unless he had a great deal to gain by it, the thin dragon said in a thoughtful tone. She turned her head and looked speculatively at Simmerine. Such as, Warag said. He waited a moment, but no one answered. No, I, I can't believe it was Zenmar. The girls made a mistake, that's all. Perhaps it wasn't him, Simmerine said, holding on to her temper as hard as she could. I've never met Zeminar, so I wouldn't know, but that's who he said he was. And wouldn't it be amusing if she were right, the purple-green dragon said, showing some interest in the proceedings for the first time. I don't see it matters, the silver-green dragon said. The important thing is that he's a wizard poking around smack in the middle of our mountains. What are we going to do about it? Tell King Tokaz, Roxim said. His job to handle this thing, isn't it? What can Tokaz do about it? Warag said. And there was a faint undercurrent of contempt in his voice. He could use the king's crystal to find out what the wizards are really doing, the thin dragon said, in a plain, prim tone. He won't use the crystal for anything less than a full-fledged war, Warag said. And why should he? What could Tokaz do, even if he did find out some wizard was preying on poor defenseless dragons like Garim? Lodge a form of protest with the Society of Wizards, Roxham answered promptly, ignoring Warag's sarcasm. Proper thing to do, no questions. <laughs> then, next time anyone sees a wizard, his voice trailed off, and he snapped his teeth together suggestively. He'd probably just set up a committee, the purple-green dragon said. Can't anyone think of something else? I don't think we should do anything until we have some idea of what Zeminar was after, said the thin dragon. It could be important. We have to do something, the silver-green dragon said. His claws clashed against the stone table. We can't have wizards wandering in and out whenever they please. Why, we'd lose half of our magic in no time. Not to mention everyone sneezing themselves silly every time one of those dratted staffs get too close, added the dragon at the far end. The dragons began arguing amongst themselves about what to do and how best to do it. It reminded Simmerine of the way her father's ministers argued. Everyone seemed to agree that something ought to be done about the wizards, but they each had a different idea about what was appropriate. Roxham insisted huffily that the only thing to do was inform the king, who would then make a formal protest. The thin dragon wanted to find out what the wizards were up to. She didn't say how this was to be done, before anyone tried to chase them off. The silver green dragon wanted patrols sent out immediately to eat any wizard who ventured into the Mountains of Mourning. The dragon at the far end of the table wanted to attack the headquarters of the Society of Wizards the following morning, and the purple green dragon thought it would be most entertaining to wait and see what the wizards did next. Warag was the only one of the guests who did not have a proposal, though he made occasional comments, usually sarcastic ones, about everyone else's suggestions. Kazool did not say anything at all. Simmerine, Simmerine was at first surprised and then puzzled by her silence, since Kazool was the one who had set up the whole discussion to begin with. As the argument grew more heated, however, Simmerine began to be glad there was one dragon at least present who was not involved in it. The dragon at the far end of the table was starting to breathe little tongues of fire at the purple-green dragon, and Roxim was threatening loudly to have another allergy attack. But Simmerine was fairly sure that Kazool would stop the discussion before things got completely out of hand. 
she was right. A moment later, while the dragon at the far end was taking a deep breath to continue arguing, and the thin dragon was winding up a long, involved train of logical reasons why her proposal was the best, Krazul said, Thank you all for your advice. I'll certainly think about it before I decide what to do. What do you mean by that? The thin dragon asked suspiciously. It was my princess who met the wizard, Kazool pointed out. Therefore, it is my decision whether to report the matter to the king, or to take some action on my own, or to ask for cooperation from some of you. None of the other dragons appeared to like hearing this, but to Simmerine's surprise, none of them gave Kazool any argument about it. The dragon at the far end of the table made a few half-hearted grumbles, but that was all. And the conversation turned to the intricacies of uh, several draconian romances that were currently in progress. As soon as her guests appeared to have calmed down, Kazul gave the signal for the empty moose dishes to be taken away, so Simmerine only heard a few incomprehensible snatches of the new conversation. She did not really mind. She had plenty to think about already. <laughs>